Hi, everyone, and welcome to our Zoomversation or Zoominar. You can choose your term. I'm Jody Rudoran. I'm the editor in chief of The Forward. And this is the latest in a series of conversations that we're hosting with Jewish leaders around the country and world uh, during this pandemic. We're very excited uh, to have an amazing group of people with us who um, really, who, have, who are doing the hardest of hard work in this pandemic, um, serving some of the neediest people on the front lines, running organizations that are right in the fray of, and, and they are um, all like adapting super quickly to the changing needs of our community, of the broader community. And we, we planned this conversation for Cholamoid Pesach, um, under the spirit of Mount Chitim and our, the commandment for us to give to the poor during this holiday. And I, I wanted to tap into the instinct that a lot of us are feeling of like, never has it been more urgent and more important to think about tikkun olam, um, repairing the world, helping. And yet in some ways, it's also really much harder uh, for people to understand how they fit in, where they can help. So we've got a great uh, panel today of people, as I said, actually really doing the work. I'm gonna introduce them very quickly, briefly, and then we'll sort of do a round of talking to them a little bit about what they've been up to the last few weeks and how their organizations are responding to this urgent, urgent crisis. Um, we will be open to your uh, questions. If you have a question, you should use the Q&A uh, button, which is at the bottom of your screen if you're on a laptop, probably on the left if you're on an iPad or a phone. Um, just, you probably know this by now, you're all Zoom experts, but just don't worry. If you click on the Q&A, it won't affect your video, it won't disrupt the conversation. You can also post in the chat if you wanna share something with the whole audience a comment. But if you have a question that you want me to post to the panelists, the best thing is to do is to put it into the Q&A. Um, so I'm, as I said, here are my guests. We have Rabbi David Rosen of the Hebrew Free Loan Society, which in normal times uh, lends about $20 million a year to something like 2,400 borrowers. These are uh, low or no interest loans, right? No interest loans, I think. Um, Zero, that's great, um, to, for all kinds of things, whether it be a bridge loan to help somebody uh, in a bad business situation or help someone pay for college. But in this moment, they have totally transformed their model and have been sending as much money out the door as quickly as possible. Um, Rabbi Rosen, before joining the Loan Society, was the executive vice president of the New Israel Fund, and he was one of the founders of Avodah, the Jewish um, service organization. Um, so he has a long history in the Jewish nonprofit space in direct service. Um, speaking of Avodah, we have also La Pukach, who is a graduate of the Avodah program. She worked at a domestic violence program there and now is the director of advocacy at Miriam's Kitchen in Washington, D.C. As you can imagine, Miriam's Kitchen is a place that feeds people, feeds hungry people, and they have been serving more than 300 meals a day during this pandemic. Um, and we'll talk more about what what uh, Miri what Lara's role is. Sorry, I got you confused with Miriam. Um, what Lara's role is uh, working behind the scenes, mostly in advocacy and direct advocacy, while other people are in um, the pantry giving out food. Um, we also have with us Eric Fingerhut, the CEO of Jewish Federations of North America. Um, Eric has been critical during this pandemic in leading a coalition to lobby Congress to include nonprofits in the um, SBA loan program and in other ways in terms of the, um, the important legislation that's been moving, the crisis legislation, and has also been just really uh, in touch with the various ways that federations themselves and constituent agencies are adapting and innovating kind of in the moment all the time. And it will help us uh, learn more about the different things that are happening around the country uh, in that space. We also have with us Cindy Greenberg, who's CEO and president of Repair the World, the aptly named. Um, the Repair the World is based in New York um, and has done, a, is doing a ton of stuff in Brooklyn and in Harlem. It's working with kids um, who are out of school right now, also supporting people who are incarcerated and has been doing also one of the things I'm most interested in is the way they have been working on the super local level, uh, block by block in some ways to engage um, community activism 
there. And then from Los Angeles, we have um, Nancy, whose bio I've just misplaced in my in my um, in my document here. I'm so sorry, Nancy. But uh, Nancy Volpert is running um, the Jewish Family Services of LA, correct? Is that right? And they are also uh, doing a lot in the kind of food pantry and um, food insecure space. And it's been really interesting to see how they've had to adapt in terms of like, I think Nancy told me yesterday that something like 90% of their volunteers or 95% even are over 65 immunocompromised, haven't been able to work. Um, if, I'm, if I'm mixing that up about who told me that, I apologize. Um, anyway, th those are my brief introductions. Eric, I'm gonna start with you. If you can give us a like bird's eye view of the kind of shifting that you've seen in the uh, in the, sur the direct service part of the Jewish nonprofit world in terms of how people have adapted quickly in this moment. Um, give us a couple bullet points on that and then we'll move on. Um, sure, so thank you for having me. Um, you know, I, I just have to say, I've been blown away by watching the agencies, some of whom are on this, uh, on this uh, call as colleagues and uh, and then across the, uh, the 146 Federation communities and all the agencies they work with, uh, because in, in uh, many ways, almost overnight, uh, their business and financial models just got thrown out the window, right? <laughs> Imagine that, that it, the way you did your work, you couldn't do anymore the same way, and the way you paid for your work, it wasn't gonna you know, be the same way, an entire, uh, an entire shift. And, and it's been extraordinary. So, you know, as you point out on the, on the service side, uh, of course, the biggest change, and it cuts across, uh, you know, Laura, I'm sure can talk to us about food pantries and, um, and, and Nancy maybe more about counseling and family services, they're more expert in it uh, individually, those areas that I am, but whether it's, whether it's food, whether it's seniors, whether it's uh, counseling, shelters, Everything that used to be about come to our, our center, come to our building um, where we will serve you, um, has now had to be uh, completely reoriented uh, to either a delivery model or an online model. Um, and, you know, for look, online works for a nice Zoom like this. We can all get together in a way. We would have done this, this kind of conversation by Zoom anyway, right? Uh, you know, even before the crisis. But, but human services is about you know, it was about being with people and about the personal connection. And, and then, uh, and so whether it's, as I said, food deliveries, uh, relationship, uh, you know, uh, uh, building that has to be outside the, uh, the area. And then, and then there's a huge spike in, in the need, right? Mental health needs of isolated families is just off the charts. Um, so not only can you not deliver services the way you normally have, you have to find different way to deliver it, and you're having this massive, uh, this massive expansion. So they are doing things like, you know, uh, in, in Detroit, you know, delivering meals twice a day uh, to seniors, whereas the, you know, the seniors uh, used to come. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, mobilizing staff to make phone calls to, to, to shut-ins, you know, to, to isolated people, I'm shut-ins. We're all shut-ins, right? To, to isolated, uh, you know, seniors particularly and others every day. You know, connecting as I'm sure Cindy can talk more about people to, to volunteer service hillels and um, and Moisha houses, giving giving people things that they can do that are that are constructive. So so that's on that side. I, I'll just say one word about the business model, the financial side, if I can. I know it wasn't your question exactly, but who would have ever thought we? In the same in the same conversation that started with Maot team funds, we'd be talking about SBA, right? Uh, but but truly, this is an entire sector that never thought in their life about applying for a government loan or you know or having a relationship with a bank you know that would be a lender or calculating the, you know percentages that would be forgiven and not forgiven. This this just to keep their employees paid. Uh, and 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 vendors, you know, basic vendor services, so that they can serve. They've had to turn themselves into, uh, you know, essentially small business owners who are, are applying, you know, through a government process. Um, and uh, as you mentioned, we've done everything we can to help them. We have volunteers that are, you know, that are working 
um, uh, to train people how to do it, banks that are helping to reach out. Uh, but, but, you know, they've had to completely uh, rethink how do, we, how do we just avoid laying off our employees? How do we, you know, JCCs, uh, most 80% uh, of fee for service model, all of a sudden just stops, right? Okay. <laughs> they close the door and all the fees that, and they want to provide service. So those are the kinds of things that are happening out there. Um, thanks, Eric. Nancy, can you pick up on that and actually just talk, I really tell us about how you did have to like go upside down in terms of the, um, the changes in that, in the delivery as, as that Eric was talking about. And then just to prep everyone, I would really love to hear everyone talk a little bit about the, the more, um, the harder to touch parts of what Eric was talking about, about when human services can't be as human. How do you replace that human directness um, when there is that distance. So Nancy, but why don't you tell us a little bit about the, the, the major changes you've had to make and how you've worked with the transportation company and all that. Okay. So first, thank you. Um, thanks to the forward for hosting this conversation um, and, and including us in it. I, I am happy to share a screen with, with colleagues uh, from across the country, which is something that is part of our new um, way of doing business. But it's, you know, it's really interesting because I think Eric, you mentioned a lot of it and we certainly have partnered closely both with JFNA and our local Jewish Federation on how we figure out how to respond. But at Jewish Family Service in Los Angeles, we really had to change our model of deli service delivery in the span of a few days. And while our domestic violence shelters continue operating, um, we had, you know, multiple support groups that met in person. Eight of our support groups for domestic violence survivors are now being held via Zoom um, with, you know, uh, more secure logins and passwords, but trying to figure out how you provide that. Our counseling services and case management is all now being done through telehealth. Um, not only do not all of our clients have the capacity, but not all of our staff, our social workers and marriage and family therapists, did they have the skill set and technology? So we've had to look at how we deliver services um, differently. And as I think Eric mentioned, you know, we have people who used to have a therapy session, counseling session once a week, once a, every few weeks, and now they're wanting to talk to someone twice a week, three times a week because of the high levels of anxiety. Um, you were correct when you mentioned um, at our food pantry, 95% of our volunteers are no longer coming in um, because they are not able to because they are in high risk categories. Um, and so how do we change our model when we are getting twice as many people who come seeking groceries? Um, and so we have changed into, we now prepare bags of groceries with volunteers and staff who are wearing masks and gloves in our, in our warehouse. And then we're handing out bags of groceries basically in our parking lot um, as people check in and then we provide groceries, enough groceries um, for a week's worth of food per person in the household. Um, and we also have kosher groceries available for those who need it. But we have had to change how we do that completely. And with the stay at home orders, safer at home here in Los Angeles, we're also looking at how do we deliver groceries to older adults who never needed our, our help before, but they can't get out and they can't get to us or to a market. And quite frankly, the grocery delivery services have not been able to manage the, the need out here. And uh, I can tell you that my parents would not have groceries if it weren't for my sister and for me being able to go to the market for on their behalf. They tried for two weeks to order online, cannot get them and they are um, certainly in that age group. And so we've really had to look at changing everything about how we provide services. I don't know who wants to jump in next, but I really want to hear you. You all are experiencing the same, the essential same thing of like, I mean, all of us in all of our jobs, right? We are changing the way we interact with, with other humans. Um, but I feel like this, the, 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 the magic in w with which direct service nonprofits um, connected to some of the most vulnerable populations is, is such an amazing thing that all of you have spent your lives kind of working on. And to have that disrupted feels like such, 
such a hard challenge. And I wonder what you're, what you're seeing yourselves personally or with your employees and volunteers in terms of, of how they're coping with that, how they're readjusting in some of the ways Nancy talked about too. Jody, I'll jump Jody, in. I, Let's Cindy, go David, yeah. Cindy, Lara, just for. Okay. Uh, actually, I'm not experiencing what you described. Um, if anything, we have accelerated the pace of what we were doing anyway, which is to try to move a lot of our lending online and, and to make it easier for people to access what we have without having to come into our office and do an in-person interview. So now we've moved all of that by necessity, you know, onto video and we're really different. We're, we're not a human services organization in the same way. We make 0% interest loans to lower income New Yorkers. And our main job is to try to reach as many people as we can with financial resources. So in a weird way, um, this has just been an accelerant for us to, to, to um, put into place things which we have been working on and just needed to move toward faster. But I will tell you that the, um, we were already a mismatch for the need in New York City. <laughs> and, and now um, it really feels like um, we are so outnumbered by, by people who need what we have to offer. I, we, we have increased the amount of lending that we're doing. We have stopped taking repayments from people who have current loans uh, from us. And still it, it feels like um, it is a drop in the bucket. And I know that many of my colleagues feel the same because there is something larger happening here than I think all of us or most of us have experienced in our lifetimes. And, and that I think is the background against which all of us are working. And, you know, we'll be creative to figure out um, how to handle um, doing things differently than we have before, but the scale of the impact on our institutions and on the people in our community is just enormous. Cindy? Yeah, we've been talking a lot at Repair the World about how um, when faced with a crisis, people, um, people often have the response of fight, flight, or freeze, right? That's the common uh, response to crisis. Um, and that as Jews, our response needs to be different. Our response to crisis is to do good. So I would propose that we add a fourth, a fourth reaction um, to how we respond, and that is to do good in the world. Um, and I've seen a couple of questions have come in on the Q&A, and I just, I want to say that, um, look, I think on the one hand, you can look at social distancing as just the most massive and incredible demonstration of the Jewish value of caring for our neighbors um, that the world has ever seen, right? How incredible um, that we've basically paused the world um, to show that we care about the people, right? The most the most repeated mitzvah in the Torah, to care for our strangers, to care for our neighbors, because we as the Jewish community know what it means to be, to be strangers. The whole world is enacting that and it's, it's beautiful. Um, and on the other hand, it's, um, it's foundational, but it's not nearly enough. Um, and I think we can sometimes feel paralyzed by the scope um, by the magnitude of the crisis that's in front of us, but our tradition teaches us that just because we can't finish the job, it's our role to take a step. Um, and what I would really encourage, I love these two questions that have come in on the Q&A, like, what can I do? How can I take action? Um, and if there's one thing I want to say to the amazing community who's gathered together today, it's that each of us has something to contribute in this crisis beyond social distancing. Um, there, are, there are desperate needs that need to be met in terms of volunteering in person. And we've seen across the country, we have um, 65 service partners that we work with um, in nine communities. And we've seen that um, the food kitchens, uh, the soup kitchens and food pantries are desperate for volunteers and have, for the most part, really put in very strict CDC guideline following um, regulations so that volunteers can continue to be helpful, especially young volunteers, um, given that so many of the volunteers have historically been older. There's a real need right now for young people to be volunteering. Um, donating blood for those of us who have had COVID-19, donating plasma. Um, so real opportunities to be volunteering in person. Um, and there's also opportunities to be volunteering volunteering at home. So for those of us who can't leave, um, the Repair the World website, which I'll share with you, has more than 30 opportunities right now to volunteer virtually. We can do 
online tutoring. We can do check-in calls with isolated seniors. There are projects for families and for kids um, to send cards to healthcare workers and to isolated seniors. Um, and of course, skilled volunteering. So especially for those people who find themselves out of work, who have time, um, more time on their hands, there are ways that they can be supporting nonprofits using the skills that they've developed professionally to, um, to be helping. And I would say most importantly is hyper-local volunteering. Um, so really thinking carefully about who your neighbors are, right? Who's on your block, who's in your building, how you might support them. We've heard amazing heartwarming stories of people tucking notes under the doors um, of their neighbors, offering their phone number, or their email address to be of service to people who are in need of grocery runs, of, um, of any kind of care. Um, and I think that that is just such an important thing for the Jewish community to be doing right now. Thank you so much, Cindy. Um, so Hillary Younell had asked um, uh, what, what was on my mind as well of like where to best find a, a tzedek project or a mitzvah project for her son who's preparing for his bar mitzvah um, in March. My children are b'nai mitzvah in November and I have given them the assignment of finding a mitzvah project in coronavirus. So I'm very happy to hear the Repair of the World website has those listings. Um, we also had Robin Frisch ask pretty much the same question. So thank you for addressing those and we will get um, those websites into the chat as soon as we can so that you all can have those resources. We'll also be following up um, for everyone on this call with an email that will have the video of this call if you want to share it with friends and also uh, whatever resources we mentioned that we think you'll need. So sorry uh, to delay, Lara, but why don't you pick up from there and tell us a little bit about what you're seeing at Miriam's Kitchen. Yeah, thank you. I mean, in many ways, we're doing what we always do, but we're doing it differently, right? So um, you know, we're usually serving about 150 folks for each meal um, in a big dining room, right, where we're building community. But we've had to move those meals outside. We've made them to go meals. So the question is a good one, right? How do you build community when um, what used to be a room full of people um, is no longer possible? Um, similarly, we usually rely on 2,000 volunteers, right, to um, support our work and to get those meals made. Um, and we suspended volunteer service about a month ago. So um, we're able to get it done and it just means people working harder and longer a little bit on our team. So, so grateful to them, but um, it's also this remaining question, right? How do we keep engaging and building community with these 2000 folks who are committed to the mission but aren't able to come in? And I think the last thing I'll say is, you know, part of how we're showing up for people experiencing homelessness is just trying to do whatever we can to supply them with what they need. And sometimes that's not, um, very glamorous, right? I mean, part of what we're seeing is that um, people need access to water and restrooms, right? We're all worried about our health and safety, but it's hard to wash your hands if you don't have a sink and it's hard to stay home if you don't have one. So um, we rented a restroom trailer, the kind you might have seen at an outdoor um, fancy wedding, and we're renting that to make sure that people have 12 hour access to restrooms since they can't come in the building. Um, and then we're trying to get creative where we can. So one thing we often offer under non-pandemic times is art therapy to really create a space for people who have been through a lot of trauma, who are feeling isolated to kind of connect with themselves or others through art. Um, so we've started offering that by phone and you know our art therapists are connecting with folks that have phones and kind of walking them through prompts, prompts to do art, which is um, really creative. And then similarly, we have a lot of clients that have recently moved into housing, but maybe had been outside on the streets for years, even decades and they're feeling really isolated. So we're making sure that we're calling every single one and checking in with them to see um, both what they need in terms of phone and other urgent needs, but to also just to say hi and make sure that folks have the opportunity to connect um, to Miriam's Kitchen um, since that's a place they found a home. Jordan, can I add just one quick thing? Sure. Because you, the, your question, I loved all the positive uh, answers. Your question was also about the stress on, uh, on the employees. And there actually has been a question in the, in the in the q and I saw about employees. I wanna mention one particular sector and that's the senior homes. Um, because obviously federations, many communities have a Jewish senior home and an assisted living. There's an association of Jewish senior, I don't know what the exact acronym is, Jewish Homes of Aging. Um, and, and of course these places have been so extraordinarily impacted because their patients are the most vulnerable. Um, they, you know, their families can't visit their families that are in the homes, um, and and the stress on the workers who are in the, you know, in the home trying to provide care, uh, and then trying to take care of their own families. Um, so the the stress on uh, on on the workforce, particularly in the human services space, and it's certainly true at Nancy's. Uh, at Nancy's organization, I know, is so high 
Um, and so, for example, we've had like in Cleveland, they, they uh, have been setting up, uh, they've been giving out gift cards for food and groceries and actually bringing groceries to give to home health care workers as they're leaving their shift uh, just to take home so they don't have to go shopping. They can just go home to their, their families. And, uh, and, and I, I just want to say, look, the, the fact is we have this extraordinary professional field in, in Jewish human services and in Jewish life, education, engagement. Um, and, and, you know, it's not going to, they're not all going to be able to stay employed and, and, you know, they're not all going to be able to come back, you know, after the furloughs, this is going to be, this is going to be a, a period of some retrenchment for many, many organizations. It's just a fact. It's going to be a fact in business. It's going to be a fact in our profit. So how we also care for, um, our professional field, you asked. I want to say it's a high priority for us. Just uh, we have a you were citing resources. So on the SBA loans, JewishTogether.org is where you can get all the information about uh, access them. Which, by the way, even independent contractors are eligible for. So if you're a, a solo teacher who contracts, or a or a, a, a scholar that usually works on speaking fees and such, you're an independent contractor. Just JewishTogether.org. And we also have a coalition of the major umbrella organizations. Sydney is a part of it, of our steering committee, you know, the JCCs and the Hillels and the day schools. So they were all working together to try to address these, these mega issues of employment and stress and all that. So thank you for letting me add that. I feel like an un, um, unknown to me before, um, either benefit or perhaps problem with Zoom is that it may put moderators out of business since you guys are all seeing the questions and answering them before I have a chance to raise them. But I'll, I'll worry about that later. Um, actually, I want to pick up on a couple of things people have been talking about. The first is about, uh, I mean, Nancy, Lara, and, and Cindy, and all of you, but maybe you three in particular, you've all talked about the various ways, the kind of extraordinary lengths that you went to, to um, be focused on giving dignity, giving human dignity to some of the most vulnerable people, right? To how do you give homeless people or people with serious food insecurity or the survivors of domestic abuse or people with major mental health problems, you know, really creating human dignity in your interactions with them. And I feel like that is such a key Jewish value of tikkun olam and of the various, you think of the, the ladder of charity, right, is to, to keep the dignity of every human kind of present and front. And yet I feel like this has really been challenging for that. Like, so I would love you to talk about how you've worked to maintain that aspect in your work when some of the ways that you did it before, I forget who was talking about, you used to have the ability to pick out your own groceries at the food pantry and now it's prepackaged. So, you know, before it was much more like a middle-class experience and now it's a little bit more like a handout. Um, and then the second question on my mind and maybe is particularly for um, Rabbi Rosen to jump in on is the way that this crisis has created whole new batches of clients, people who wouldn't think of themselves as needy are now needy. And how do you access that, make, give dignity to that, but also make them understand what services, how do you reach that whole new pool? I'm gonna let whoever wants to dive into the first one. I can jump in. I think, um, you know, part of what I think has made it a little bit of an easier transition for us is that Dignity, and I'm sure this is true of the other organizations on the call, has just been a central pillar of how we do business all, since the beginning, right, as always. And so once you're in the practice of making sure that the dignity of the people that you're working with and serving is kind of just part of how you do your work, um, it's a little easier to make sure that's still in the center when you have to shift. Um, and so, you know, that includes things for us like, for example, the media is really interested in what Miriam's Kitchen um, is doing right now for good reason. Um, and that um, isn't always an easy thing, right? To be fielding cameras and reporters um, on site when we're already trying to kind of do social distancing and make sure that everyone is safe and well and that they're at choice about whether they wanna be on camera, right? Or a part of news. Um, but, you know, having had um, protocols kind of in place beforehand and all the time with media to think about how do we handle media and how do we um, empower our guests to kind of be a part of that process as much as they want to, made it so that like when all of a sudden there was this thing that the media was much more interested in, we were kind of prepared to handle it. So that's what I would offer. I think I would add um, that parallel to the value of dignity, I think this moment also really calls upon us to think about the value of justice. 
um, and that it's not enough just to care for those who are in need. Though that, of course, is is an important piece of our tradition, but it's also, I think, a moment in which um, we need to just acknowledge that Black and Brown people are being disproportionately impacted, um, both by the virus and by the economic downturn um, in this country. And I think. Um, just, just parallel to the dignity issues, I think this moment is is bringing light upon the issue that many of us have been working on now for years, which is acknowledging the ways in which our systems um, are disproportionately impacting Black and Brown people. And I think as we aim our service towards the Jewish community, we also need to um, acknowledge those who are in, in the most need in, in this moment and yeah, really, look, really look to our neighbors. Because the other thing that I think is happening um, sort of naturally, right? But this time of intense stress also makes us sort of tribal and insular in a way, right? It's very hard to, to look far um, when, when everybody feels like they're under siege. I mean, and this is almost unique in our history, this idea that there's this thing happening that's actually affecting everyone. And at first it seemed like it was affecting everyone kind of equally, and now we're really seeing that it's not. Um, well, I, I, I saw you jumping in two minutes. Go ahead. Oh, one aspect of that is um, access to these SBA loans uh, has become, it's become clear that if you don't have a pre-existing relationship with a lender, you're not going to have access in the same way or at all. And um, as Cindy was talking about, uh, you know, people, uh, African-American communities have not had access to financial services in the same way that um, other Americans have. And it's a mess right now because the small business owners who are trying to access this, this resource that the government intends to help you know, keep small businesses afloat, um, they are not able to access it uh, in the same way. And I wanna just um, call out for excellence the work that JFNA has been doing on making it possible for the nonprofit structure um, that supports the Jewish community and that the Jewish community supports to figure out this really complicated and clunky program. Um, it, it's just been outstanding, the work that, that they've been doing, both on the advocacy level to get the thing going in the first place and to make sure that everyone is included, but also just simply explaining how to access this. And at the same time, I want to note that we're lucky and privileged as a community to have something like JFNA. And there are thousands, tens of thousands of nonprofits and small businesses that are out there struggling on their own, trying to navigate this and you know, I'm, I'm sure not succeeding. So there is really um, an aspect in which the virus is a great leveler. <laughs> and there's an aspect in which the virus just lays bare all the ways in which it's not a level playing field in our country. So just to, to build on that, uh, so that I, I can hopefully give some hope. Uh, uh, first of all, David, thank you for the, for the, for the nice words. But um, we're, we will stay at this until everyone has access to these resources. And I mean everyone, uh, not just the Jewish community. So in fact, Cindy and I had a conversation just last night uh, about you know, help us, all of you who have relationships with organizations, uh, religious, you know, churches, mosques, uh, uh, community centers that we might not have direct access to. We would not just love. We will. We will just be honored and privileged to be able to help other communities access it. We have done some. We've done some some webinars for some churches and um, uh, and other uh, other faith groups. Um, and and we will we will remain open for business. Um, every every email that that you send to our SBA hotline, which is on JewishTogether.org, gets responded to. Uh, we know that our resources have gone to out through United Ways and through other um, you know through other networks. But anyone who's listening to this webinar, please help us. It is absolutely a moment where we know that. As hard as it is for us to access banking resources, we at least, you know, JFNA can pick up the phone and call banks, and um, and and we we absolutely want to respond to the need that Rabbi Rosen has, uh, you know, has has articulated. This is not going to be done overnight, right? There's a long line, um, so so we're going to be in this for weeks, and uh, you know, we're going to get more money in the program hopefully this week. We've been advocating for a replenishment of the fund, which, you know, knock on wood, is going to happen. Um, and, and so we will keep at it. So help us help, help us help the communities that need help.
Thank you, Nancy. I, I, I know you've been trying to get in for a couple of uh, rounds here. So over to you. Thanks. I, I just, I, you know, I think a couple of points I want to add, partly in answer to your question, but also, you know, something that that my my co 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 partners have implied. This is not going to be a short term ch term change in how we're delivering services. So I think the question of how we're learning to adapt, um, some we've had to do really quickly and some is working really well. And some we've had to do quickly and with this luxury of time and space and resources, we, we will likely adapt. But the value, the person-centered lens through which we provide services here in Los Angeles. And I will say our, um, our client base looks like our city. So we serve everybody. And um, that lens doesn't change regardless of how the technology has changed. And so um, that focus is going to be with us. It's been with us for 165 years. It's going to continue. You know, we adapt, we change, we meet the needs of our time. Um, so I think that's part of how we keep doing it with, as you said, um, respecting and valuing individual dignity. But I also think if you look at, we are the largest provider of services to Holocaust survivors on the West Coast. And what we're doing, you know, we are now doing interactive activities through essentially a Zoom platform. It's, it's, it's more interactive, but with, um, with Holocaust survivors. Uh, we are obviously home delivering meals to people who used to come in for meals five days a week. We are, um, we've had a 40% increase so far in the amount of meals we're delivering to seniors. Um, but we are looking at doubling the number of people at our food pantry. And so, and the number of calls to our intake and social work lines, I can't even, we can't even keep track. It's, it's unbelievable how many people are calling. But we are doing it as part of a community and you know people have asked how they can help and how they can participate and truly um our volunteers are our lifelines um and i know people don't like want to be told that we need money but you know donations are critical right now for all of our agencies but so is advocacy you know jfna has done this amazing job leading the charge on um, ensuring that nonprofits and in my case, Medicaid recipients, uh, Medicaid recipient agencies were eligible. But our board members, our volunteers, our staff made phone calls to our senators and to our members of Congress and said again and again and again how important this is for us as an agency to provide services. So there's a through line in the volunteering that is it's the volunteering, it's the direct service, it's the giving money, it's the, it's the calling your members, advocating locally. Um, our state has been particularly proactive. Um, and so we are reaching out to our state legislators as well. And I've got board members who are calling state legislators saying, hey, you know, we need funds for all of these things you want us to be doing. Great work, keep Thank it up. You. Um, couple, first of all, I want to invite everybody um, to, to submit their questions through the Q&A if you have them. Um, a quick one from Judith Arndt, which I think Lara may know the answer to, is are there hotels that are vacant that are now offering any rooms for the homeless? I've, I've definitely read about offering rooms for um, healthcare workers, but are, are some hotels becoming like homeless shelters? Yeah, so um, in DC at least, we, um, our local Department of Human Services is working with hotels for a few things. Um, I mean, one is that we already actually were using hotels um, for shelters um, to meet our existing shelter capacity. But right now what's happening is that, um, you know, we had a bunch of people living in shelter who were not sick, but are medically vulnerable, right? People who are over the age of 70 or 80 years old already have kind of underlying health conditions. So um, they were able to kind of identify those that were at high risk and to move them to remote sites. Um, as a prevention mechanism, right? Knowing that those folks would be at high risk um, should they contract the virus. And at the same time, right, um, they're using hotels as quarantine sites, right? So 
um, as we've had occasional positive test cases for people that are living in shelter or other kind of congregate settings. Um, they're able to kind of do contact tracing to figure out kind of who um, has this person been in close contact to, with and then making sure we can move all those folks to remote sites so that they can be, um, you know, sheltering in place and, um, you know, preserving their safety and the safety of others and then getting kind of the food and healthcare and services that they need. Um, David, I want to turn back to you for something that I, it's a little narrower, but I'm just really intrigued um, by it. And I want to just talk about the, the kind of concept, the, the particular idea of a loan, of a no interest loan as a uh, organizing principle for the organization. And I know that you, in your prior jobs, you know, did a different kind of thing, right? Um, and I, I was, I'm interested both in um, whether there are parallel organizations that are not in the Jewish community that similarly have a similar kind of structure around them. And if you could just talk a little bit um, about where you think that particular approach kind of fits in the Jewish uh, Tikkun Olam system and why it's appealing to you, why, you know, you, what, you, what, what you think the particular, and it feels also like this moment when so many people are kind of newly vulnerable and I think we hope temporarily vulnerable that this idea of a no interest loan may be, have more life to it. Um, sure. There are lots of microfinance organizations in the world and in the United States. Very few of them lend at zero percent. That seems to be a um, distinctively Jewish approach, although we're not the only um, faith community even that has um, a commitment to lending without interest. Muslims also do this and Christians aren't so fond of usury, but they're, they don't insist on zero percent. Um, I think the idea of a loan um, as, uh, as, as the sort of highest form of tzedakah, together with helping somebody find employment or going into business with them, is that um, it's a partnership and, and it allows somebody to feel as though they are um, on the receiving end of some support, but also in there with the lender um, doing their share. And so when somebody receives a cash transfer that they need, they should take it because they need it. And we believe in everybody having you know, access to, to basic needs. But um, another way to receive support and sometimes one that feels better to people is to borrow and then be able to pay back as they're able to do that. Um, I will say that one unique aspect of how we lend at the Hebrew Free Loan Society, and there are about 40 Hebrew Free Loans all around the country. You probably have one in your city, wherever you are. Uh, we don't lend based on credit scores. We don't lend based on taking collateral from people. That's not how we secure our loans. We lend um, through mobilizing community relationships. When somebody comes to us to borrow, they have to bring a guarantor or two guarantors. These are people in their life who say, I will pay this loan off if the borrower doesn't pay. And it creates a whole bond of accountability between the borrower and the guarantor. And it results in our organization having a 99.9% .9 repayment rate. And we're lending to people who are financially, you know, not that stable. And yet they, they pay us back at an incredibly high rate. Um, I think that not only does that prove that you could actually provide for the financial needs of lower income people without charging them an arm and a leg. Whenever a for-profit lender says, oh, I have to price in the risk. I say, I don't know, I've been lending, I'm in an organization that's been lending for 128 years. We have a 99.9% .9 repayment rate. I think you're pricing in something else. Maybe it's profit, which is fine. <laughs> I'm not, you know, not against profit. You can, you can lend on profit. But if, you're tr if your aim, if your mission is to help lower income people stabilize and advance, then you can do it without charging um, exorbitant rates for credit. And, and I, I think that the system of free loans that the Jewish community has supported for centuries is, is an amazing resource that we ought to be exporting um, in many, many other contexts. Um, I, I would like for, when we get out of this mess and employers are able to think about the financial health of their employees and not just about how to keep their employees employed, 
I think there ought to be standard that every employer offers interest-free loans to their employees out of a pool of capital that they set aside for this purpose because it's a benefit that their employees ought to have and a way to get over the inevitable financial bumps that there are. This could be something that is all over the place in, in American capitalism. And that's one that of the things I'm be great. working on after we get to the other side of this. That sounds great. It sounds like an op-ed you should write for the forward. Um, <laughs> uh, I wanted to, you know, so Lois Zuckerman in the Q&A asked about how your organization is managing its employees during the pandemic. And, and Eric has talked a little bit about um, how many nonprofits, particularly JCCs, and the forward wrote about this uh, a couple of days last week, I guess, um, have had to have significant layoffs or furloughs. So I'm interested in, in people can answer that question, but I also wanted to extend it a little bit to talk about you yourselves um, as, as kind of leaders of organizations. I feel like there's been quite a lot of um, conversation around how can we support the first responders and the healthcare workers who are under so much stress and putting themselves at risk. But you guys have talked a little bit about how, how we know this is gonna be a long lasting crisis. And I just wonder like, if you could talk both about your employees and your own kind of system, like how are, how can we support you in um, in this crisis, basically? Anyone? I can jump in. Um, I think you know we talked already about donating, but I think it is like a good reminder that um, donations go not just to kind of the vulnerable populations we're talking about today, but they're it, they also help us keep the lights on, right, and pay our staff and give our staff leave. So um, just want to underscore that. Um, and I think also, you know, it, like anything else, like you said, it's a marathon, so we have to be creative and strike balance, you know. So I think for our team, what that looks like is at the leadership level, we're both making sure that um, some of us are on site every day and kind of being in solidarity with the frontline workers um, that are there, you know, cooking um, in the kitchen and serving meals to our guests. But also that some of us are staying home, um, even if we could come in, to kind of show everybody else that it's okay um, to do work from home if you can, that that can be a way that you're keeping yourself safe, um, your family safe, and kind of flattening the curve. Um, and also just normalizing things um, like self-care, like occasionally taking a day off. You know, we all are working really hard and around the clock because the work is always urgent and it's even more urgent now. Um, but at the same time, you know, we can just like we would another time, take a half day off, take a break, eat lunch, right? All these things that are easy to forget to do when you're um, at home, your sweatpants kind of working from your computer. So that's what I would add. I, can I add that? Please. Go ahead, Nancy. Sorry, Eric. No, please. I, I have to say that, and I'm sure this is true for others, but we have the best board of directors on the planet. You all may have good ones, but ours is the best. <laughs> and honestly, what they have done really does help in, 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 in that because they have, um, our board chair hopped on, we had an all staff Zoom last week and about 180 of our staff were on it. And she, our board chair came on, she talked about how, you know, how much our work means to her and she stayed on and answered questions and she was just there for everybody. And the board has made it clear um, to, to the staff how much they appreciate what we're doing. Um, we're sending out grocery gift cards to all staff this week um, as just a thanks. Um, but it is a hard question. We also are sending out employee assistance program information. We are opening up our counseling and, and case management lines to staff because we know we have staff who are impacted by not just the virus, but the economic downturn and the layoffs and their family members and the, you know, the everyone who is now homeschooling on top of it. So we're trying to make those resources available. I, I just wanted to say a word on behalf of the executives of the agencies. Um, you know, I work with 146 Federation executives. Uh, I also have the privilege of knowing many people like Nancy who run the agencies that provide the service in the communities as well as the national uh, leaders like, uh, like Cindy. Uh, these are people under, first of all, they're unbelievably committed, dedicated, hardworking people under normal circumstances. They are now working round the clock, 
sitting in front of these, uh, you know, these Zooms, uh, you know, trying to rally people, trying to manage the kinds of business decisions that we were discussing earlier that, that, that just a month ago would never, ever have occurred to them to have to deal with, you know, uh, making the most challenging decisions of all about how to keep the organizations uh, open and surviving, uh, making the decisions about what to do with employees that like the question that was asked. Um, these are just traumatic, traumatic decisions for, you know, for the executive directors and CEOs who have this burden on their shoulder, not to mention the fact that most of them also have families at home. They have parents in nursing homes. They've got young kids who they're trying to homeschool. Um, it's, uh, I, I, I've seen the I've seen performance at such a level, and, and I know there's stress with it, that, that we have to reach out and make sure that, we, that the people who are running these enterprises know that we care about them and that we're thinking about them. Thank you, Eric. Um, so we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, I wanna thank everybody again for being here and let you know if you're, on, if you're a participant on the call that um, we're gonna sign you up for a free either month or three month subscription to the forward, I forget which. And I wanna thank very much Lisa Lepton and um, Dina Cooperman for, it's one month of a subscription I've been told. Um, I wanna thank Lisa Lepton and Dina Cooperman for helping to organize this uh, Zoominar. And um, please do tell your friends. We have another one coming up on Tuesday. Um, actually, we're gonna not have it be about coronavirus, but um, our opinion editor, Bacha Unger-Sargon, is moderating a debate between two of our columnists over whether anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. So happy that we can get back to the perennial questions that are dogging our community. Um, it's at noon on the 21st, not two o'clock. I'm making all kinds of mistakes. I hope you all forgive me, I apologize. Um, what I wanna do in our last few minutes um, is, Partly because, look, I want everybody to really walk away with a sense of what they can do to get involved and to help and to be part of um, the amazing Tikkun Olam work that you are leading and that is so critical to our community. So I think we, we started the call really focused on that and we've shared these resources in the chat of um, literally things, ways, links for pe people to jump on and that's what I'm gonna do when I get off the call. But what I would love for each of you to share and I know you've got them like in spades, it's just an anecdote, an example that you've seen either within your organization or not, that you, even if it's something you read about or whatever, of someone who just did something really creative, really extraordinary, maybe it was really simple, um, that like really met this moment with the spirit of tikkun olam and of direct helping. Um, I just, I feel like you guys see the stuff and I want you to, to share it to help inspire us. Um, so that's your assignment. Who wants to go first? I'll go first. Uh, my colleague in Chicago um, organized a Shabbat dinner for a group of friends and people who she knew through, um, through her work and the organization. And um, they enjoyed a beautiful Shabbat meal, you know, in isolation via Zoom um, with Shabbat ritual. And, and they paused in the middle of the dinner. Um, and she shared with each of them a, um, an outline for a letter um, that they could use to reach out to their neighbors. Um, and all together as a group, they each printed out 20 or 30 copies of this letter um, where they wrote in their name and their phone number and offered to give assistance um, to their neighbors. And when the dinner concluded, they each committed to going out and distributing the letters underneath the doors of, um, of their neighbors. So cool. Okay, who's next? Well, uh, I'll... Um... I'm going to break the rule just a little bit because the, the 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 thing that I do want people to know it's besides my job it's my passion is um, you know federations have been around for a hundred years and uh, sometimes you don't notice them or what they do in a community but it's in moments like this when you do notice them sometimes you're annoyed by those annual campaign calls or those super Sunday calls and you're not sure why um, and it's moments like this when you do know it. Um, just the Federation of New York, UJ Federation of New York, has gone into their endowment now for over $45 million, just taken it out and spent it, given it to agencies, 
um, you know, kept the doors open, uh, kept the camps open, uh, you know, forgiven rent to JCCs. I mean, everything. It's just extraordinary. Every day I talk to them, they just made another, you know, the board convened again to, to make another set of loans, another set of grants. Um, and of course, this is happening. New York's the largest, it's the largest Jewish community, the largest federation. So I use that as an example. But this is, of course, happening all across the country um, in every community. And so my answer to how you can help is uh, if, if it's been a long time or if you didn't ever know, you know, where your federation was in your community or how to reach them, uh, you know, this is as good, this is a great time to reach out and say, you know, Hineni, here I am um, as a volunteer. Um, you know, as, as part of our community. Um, and I know they'll know what to, how to put it to work. You can always find your federation both through JewishTogether.org or through uh, JFNA.org. Um, but, uh, but just be part of the community. I'll teach Rosh Minetzi Bor, right? The Hill El Tat. Don't separate yourself from the community. Now's the time to lean into the community. Um, and we, so we know people it. can both write checks and write letters. Um, they can do both. So uh, what else? Nancy, you want to go? Sure. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about food. Uh, we'll keep talking about food. Um, but one of the things that say um, the fallout from people, I don't know about your communities, but in ours where people are hoarding food from the grocery stores, canned goods and others, despite the fact that we know um, that there is plenty of food. If you have, um, done that and you realize you no longer need 800 cans of particular food, beans, any kinds of proteins, any kinds of uh, food, you know, think about contributing them to your local food pantry or, or, or food bank. Um, we rely on a huge amount of uh, grocery store overage um, at our pantries and there is no overage right now. So that means we're going to end up having to buy more food. So Go through your pantry. It's a great um, quarantine activity. Clean out your pantry. <laughs> Not all the expired icky stuff, but you know. Um, and Nancy, is there a good resource, a good national website clearinghouse to find a local pantry near you? Feeding America. Feeding America. Okay, great. Feeding so Lara America and David, work. just again, I'd love you to share just one anecdote of something that you've seen happen that you thought was really creative or cool or generous. Larry, you go first, and then we'll give the rabbi the last word, because he's a rabbi. I mean, one thing that um, we see all year round, but are seeing a lot right now, that it continues to be inspiring, is that um, a lot of the advocacy here locally is being led by people with lived experience of homelessness, or people that are still experiencing homelessness. Um, and, you know, sometimes without access to internet or phone, you know, folks are um, raising their voice, and even folks who have very little or nothing are looking out for um, other folks that are going through what they've been through or what they're going through. And so, um, you know, with that um, kind of anecdote and a shout out to their leadership, I would just, you know, encourage folks to think about how you can raise your voice. You know, advocacy doesn't have to be a dirty word. And, um, you know, a guest advocate that I work closely with, Walden Adams, you know, he says, advocacy is really just caring about something and then telling someone you care. And I think it's, that's just a great framing for it that we all have a voice and in whatever way feels comfortable for us, um, raise that voice in the way that you might for any other thing that you care about. David. So I want to full-throatedly endorse everything everybody said, especially the point, the last point about advocacy. I also want to say you should pay your folks. Um, if you are in a position to have somebody who cleans your house but can't come over and you are able to pay that person even though they're not coming, you should do that because they are depending upon you. And that goes for nannies and it goes for lots of lots of people who are, you know, sort of out there wondering um, where the next uh, rent payment or grocery bill is going to come from. Uh, I, I just, I, I want to say that I think people are looking for meaning in all of this. And I think that's entirely natural. Um, I also think it's risky, and I think that um, it's difficult, and it's probably also too soon. Um, I, I think that the meaning of events takes time to unfold, um, not just because we need some distance from something to understand it, but you know, because the meaning of something emerges from the way that we respond to it and how it leads all of us to change our lives. You know, I ask myself, are we going to become more fearful 
and separated because of all of this or less fearful and more connected? Are we gonna try to um, get back to some sort of um, before all this happened, which frankly had a lot of problems, our society was not perfect before all this happened, or are we gonna try to work to shape a world that somehow honors the pain and the suffering that we are all going through and acknowledges that there are just huge social fissures that are laid bare by the virus and um, are having really different impacts on different communities. Um, I think the choices that we make about all of these things are gonna be decisive in establishing the meaning of the pandemic. I, I can't imagine going through something like this and not having it change us and not having it w make us want to change things. So if you don't want this to be meaningless, <laughs> I think everyone should pick one thing that the pandemic has made them realize needs to change and you should commit very seriously to working on changing that one thing. And I guarantee that whatever you achieve will change the meaning of all of this for you. And if all of us do that, I think it changes the meaning of all of this for the history books. Well done, um, Rabbi Rosen. Thank you for that. It's a really inspiring and thoughtful way to end. Um, and thanks to all of you, Nancy Volpert, Lara Pukach, Cindy Greenberg, and Eric Fingerhut. Thank you for joining us. Thanks to all of our participants. Um, we we'll hope we'll see you next week at our Zoom on Tuesday at noon. And uh, I hope you'll keep reading the forward. Chag Sameach. Thank you, Jody. Thank you. Great Thank to you see all. everyone. Thank you. Thank you.